This week's episode of our show has been sponsored by the incredible Grim Hollow Player's Guide, which is now available for pre-order. This book is jam-packed with player options for dark fantasy settings, including two new subclasses for every class in Dungeons & Dragons, six of which we got to write. We got the opportunity to write some really cool subclasses for this book, including the Highway Rider Rogue and the Oath of Pestilence Paladin, as well as many other awesome YouTubers like XP to Level 3 and Runesmith who also contributed subclasses to this book. This book is also jam-packed with options for transformations to turn your characters into vampires or werewolves, as well as a blood magic system. The book is totally compatible with 5th edition and jam-packed with character inspiration ideas for your next game. So check out the links below to pre-order your copy of the Grim Hollow Player's Guide. And now, onto this week's episode. Greetings, my name is Monty Martin. And I'm Kelly McLaughlin. And, and we, we are, are the Dungeon, Dungeon Dudes. Dudes. Welcome to our channel where we cover everything Dungeons and Dragons, including advice for players and guides for Dungeon Masters. We upload new videos on Tuesdays and Thursdays, so please subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an episode. Today, we are taking a look at the infusions available to artificers in Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition. This is a very unique mechanic which allows artificers to enchant non-magical items with magical properties that can either be worn or used by the artificer themselves or their allies. Now, there are 16 infusions that were introduced in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, and as artificers level up, they get to choose how many infusions they know, but then they're limited in the number of infusions they can actually have in play at any one time as well, with the additional restrictions being that you have to enchant a non-magical item, and some of them actually require attunement as if they become a magical item as well. When we look at these 16 infusions, we're going to be ranking them out of five. Five being must-have great options, and one being something that is very niche or might be overshadowed by the other options presented. Now, we are also going to try to specify if there is a specific subclass of artificer that might benefit more from a certain infusion than others. That could raise or lower the stock of the infusion, depending on the playstyle that you're bringing to the table with your artifact. Yeah, and a certain combination of infusions could produce a more powerful result than simply taking the best infusions available. So it is always worth using your discretion and looking at your party as well, because an artificer can be selfish and use all their infusions on themselves, but they can also use them to enchant the weapons and gear used by their allies. So there could be a circumstance where you have a party member that is just the absolute best use case for one of these infusions, in which case maybe it's worth more consideration. I'm probably going to try to use all the infusions on myself because I'm <laughs> greedy like that, yeah. but uh, there's a lot to discuss today, so let's get rolling. The first infusion is Arcane Propulsion Armor. This requires a 14th level Artificer, and it does require attunement once this is created. This enchants a suit of armor that increases the wearer's speed by 5 feet, has gauntlets that can be fired as a magical throne, throne attack, can replace missing limbs, and finally the armor um, cannot be removed against the wearer's will. I have to say... I don't understand the purpose of this infusion. It, 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 we're not starting out strong here because this is a an infusion that requires a 14th level character, requires attunement, and really, as far as I can tell, it's giving you a 5 foot bo bonus to movement speed and a kind of cool gauntlet attack that, well, cool, is definitely not something that I want to wait till 14th level to get. If you've made it to 14th level and you're like, I really need a 1d8 like punch damage at 20 feet, like, I don't know. I don't think that it's that valuable. Not to mention that if you're an armorer, uh, then this is like completely useless because you're going to have a yeah. lot of these right away when you become an armor. And for all the other options, I feel like there's other infusions that you're already packing that are giving you more than a 14th level infusion that's going to give you a distance punch and five feet of movement. This is one of those infusions that sounds cool, but it's a total trap. Don't take it. Uh, I give this one a one out of five. Yeah, a one out of five <laughs> sounds fair. <Yeah. laughs> Next up, we come to the Armor of Magical Strength. This has no level requirement, but still requires attunement. This suit of armor has six charges, and you can expend a charge to add your Intelligence modifier to a Strength Ability Check or Saving Throw. 
Now, the thing with this is that it's probably really good for you as an artificer because your intelligence score is probably going to be way higher than your strength. But note that when you give this to an ally, the ability is now triggered off the ally's intelligence. Yeah, so th this is one that you want to be greedy with if you are going to take it. It's for your artificer to use their mechanical armor to increase their strength, which makes a lot of sense. I still think that there's a lot of better options yeah. out there for infusions. I give this one a 3 out of 5, which means that it could be useful for certain characters. I mean, this is going to save you when you need it to save you. Uh, it can also prevent you from being knocked prone, but... I think that it's super situational and the armor slot is super valuable. And so this wouldn't be my go-to to enchant my armor. I mean, if you have a wizard in the party, you could give them this, but they can't but they wear can't, can't armor. But they can't use armor unless they're proficient in armor. So, so I guess if yeah. you specifically have a mountain dwarf wizard in your party, <laughs> then yes, this infusion might be a great choice. If you are going to take it, it might be most useful for something like an armor or battlesmith, I would say. Next up are the Boots of the Winding Path. These require a sixth level artificer to enchant a pair of boots that require attunement. And these are really cool because they let you teleport as a bonus action 15 feet. With the requirement, however, that the target space that you teleport to has to be a square that you already occupied on the same turn. So the use case for these boots is to run in, stab somebody, and then teleport back to avoid opportunity attacks. So it won't let you teleport to somewhere that you couldn't already get. Still, I think these are cool. An artillerist or armorer might find a lot of value here so that if they are uh, getting into combat, they can then get out again. But also giving it to an ally who might want to be able to disengage readily mm -hmm could be really useful. I'm thinking of uh, rogues or monks or other characters that excel in melee combat but don't necessarily want to be a front liner. These boots can actually be really vital for the use there. The only thing that I would say is be careful with that because rogues and monks have a lot of cool things that they can do with their bonus actions to escape combat on their own. So it might actually be more useful for this to be in the hands of say a paladin or a fighter who doesn't innately have something to do with their bonus action to help them escape combat. I think this one gets a 4 out of 5. It, it might not be the greatest choice out there, but there's a lot of cases where this is one of the cooler choices. Next up we have the Enhanced Arcane Focus. This does not have a level requirement, although it does require attunement. It can be a rod, staff, or wand, and this increases your spell attack bonus by 1, and then when you reach level 10, by 2. I think that this infusion is self-sabotaged by all the other cool magic items that were introduced <laughs> in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything that boosts spell saving throw DCs and attack rolls. I think that most, um, most characters care more about their spell saving throw DC than their spell attack roll bonus, unless you're like an Eldritch Blasting Warlock. And actually, if you go through the Artificer spell list, there's not much beyond cantrips that require attack rolls. So I think that you very specifically need somebody in your party that is going to be making use of Eldritch Blast basically to get the most out of this infusion. So I give it a three out of five. If you want to give the Warlock a, a boost, cool. But otherwise this wouldn't necessarily be a go-to for me. I think that if it was a plus one to both uh, spell attack rolls and your DC, then it would be a five oh. out of five. Oh, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I think that there's a lot of magic items out there that can do similar things. And although a plus one is great, again, there's better options in here. Next up is Enhanced Defense. This one has no level requirement and is super straightforward. You choose a suit of armor or a shield and it gets a plus one bonus to AC, which rises to plus two at level 10. Doesn't require attunement at all. This one is great. AC bonuses are super hard to come by. They are often stackable. This one doesn't require any attunement or any level requirements. There is probably going to be someone in your party that could benefit from having a higher AC. It might be you. <laughs> um, and, and this means that, you know, if you have a paladin in your party who's a frontliner and they have a magic suit of armor, but they don't have a magic shield, boom, now they have both. And ultimately, the thing that makes AC strong is stacking AC boosting items spells and other features together to get that really monstrous high ac and this infusion can be the difference between having a wow that's a really high ac to 
uh, dungeon masters tearing their hair out because monsters will never hit this en- <laughs> this guy. <laughs> I think any character playing a tank can benefit from this infusion. If you're an armor or a battlesmith who's playing the front lines, then this infusion might be very appropriate for your own suit of armor. But turning your tank even more tanky is super beneficial. And keep in mind that the artificer also has the ability to make things like a cloak of protection or a ring of protection. So if they want to, they can blow all of their infusions on making the tank of the party, which could include you as an armorer, into a super tank by just stacking AC bonuses up. It can be pretty devastating to a DM trying to hit you when you have a 27 AC somehow because you're just stacking those bonuses. So keep that in mind with this infusion. I think it's five out of five. Yeah, I I, I do too. Continuing theme is the enhanced weapon. Like enhanced defense, no level requirement, no infusion requirement. Choose a weapon, gets a plus one bonus to attack rolls and damage rolls, which rises to plus two at level 10. Again, there's probably going to be someone in your party that still needs a magic weapon, and it might be you. <laughs> uh, it's great for the armorer uh, who can enhance the gauntlets of their magical armor as well, and then you just go to town from there. I, I think that this falls into the exact same boat as the defense one. You're going to have somebody who's on the front lines delivering that damage. Whoever your beatdown is, if they don't have a magic item give them a magic item. These two infusions are both the simplest and most boring, but also the most impactful. So you really have to kind of look at that, that a plus one or plus two to either your AC or your attacks is going to be super beneficial. And I think this one deserves a five out of five as well. Yeah, I think the only circumstance where enhanced defense and enhanced weapon don't really have mileage is if your G- dungeon master is super generous and has been showering you with magic weapons and armor in which case great uh yeah then you like, don't need these <laughs> yeah then you don't need these you're totally in luck anyways so uh so when the when the circum- when that is like the only circumstance where you wouldn't consider these infusions you're already ahead <laughs> Yeah. Next, we come to the Helm of Awareness. This does require you to be level 10, and it does require attunement. But this item is pretty cool. You now have advantage on your initiative rolls, and you can no longer be surprised. This is kind of like taking the alert feat, uh, but you get it on a helmet. Uh, I think that this is great. I think everyone in your party is going to be fighting each other over who gets to wear this. Because <laughs> everyone... like. If there's one thing that everybody loves, it's going first in combat and having advantage on initiative. Well, it might not actually be as powerful as it seems. It feels really good. Well, let's take into account that most of the time, if you're an artificer, there's a good chance you're either trying to get spells on the table because a lot of your spells are utility or buff or battlefield control spells, or you're the tank who wants to be Mm. on the front lines. So if you take that into account, being able to go first in combat means that you can lay down those devastating battlefield control spells, or you can get yourself into position to protect your allies. Either way, it's really valuable to go first in combat. Again, I'm being greedy. I would take the helm for myself. But if you also have a battlefield controller or somebody who really benefits from arranging the battlefield first, Giving them this item is going to be pretty clutch. I don't know. I think just giving it to your friendly neighborhood Gloomstalker Ranger or Assassin Rogue. <laughs> because those classes are going to have that high dexterity scores to begin with. And and in the case of the Gloomstalker, you actually have your Wisdom mod added. And then, so now you've got a character that's got like a plus seven bonus to initiative that's rolling with advantage. That has a great ranged weapon attack. Boom, 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 boom. High, biggest threat on the battlefield gone right away so in in talking about battlefield control i guess you could also say murdering the hardest enemy is part of controlling the battlefield (laughs) which really means this infusion is good for anybody i think again i'm I'm gonna give this one five out of five i think it's great i I love it i think it's great it's really adaptable yes it requires attunement but it's worth it the next infusion that we're looking at is the homunculus servant and is available at any level of play doesn't require attunement but it does require a gemstone worth 100 gold pieces This transforms that gemstone into a little servant, whose appearance is up to you to decide, that is your pet. 
It has a stat block and it can act in combat on your turn and you can command and control it. It actually has a bunch of cool abilities such as evasion, the ability to make a force strike attack, and as well to channel your magic for you. The homunculus is basically a super familiar with a couple different restrictions and uh, placed on it, but it can fight and it can attack and it can deal damage as a bonus action by being commanded to do so. I just think that because it is like a super familiar, it's like the fine familiar for artificers, but better. Yeah, I don't see a downside to having a homunculus servant. I think that it's not only the most thematic thing to have as an artificer, having a little robot companion, but its usefulness is off the charts here. I, I, I mean, I'm going to give it five out of five mm. without question. I think that any artificer, no matter what subclass you're playing, should have a homunculus servant. I think what's so cool about the homunculus is that it's stats scale based on your artificer level. So that little bit of force damage that it can deal, that little d4 damage, still adds your proficiency bonifier and it uses your spell attack bonus. So you really get this nice little extra companion that is useful in combat and has all the scouting capabilities that you're looking for from the familiar. Not only can this homunculus also fly, but it can also release touch-based spells. This might actually be reason to take a cantrip like Shocking Grasp. If you plan to have your homunculus, you can now kind of forego its own attack and just be delivering Shocking Grasp from your homunculus against your enemies. So there is a case there to kind of look at your spell selection and see what touch-based spells you can use, but using your homunculus and kind of turning them into your alternate spellcaster. You could use your homunculus to deliver cure wounds. So there is another case for cure wounds. And I, I think that we did talk a lot about spells in our other episode, mm. but there's a case in point here that if you are relying on your homunculus, that there's a lot of spells that you might want to consider as top-notch that weren't necessarily top-notch if you didn't have it. Next up, we come to Mind Sharpener. This has to be either armor or robes. It has no level requirement and does not require attunement. It has four charges and you can expend a charge to pass a constitution saving throw to maintain concentration on a spell that you would have otherwise failed. That's really useful for any spellcaster. Yeah, you might have a lot of people in your party, not just yourself, that want this. And I think that is the, the critical thing because Artificers have proficiency in constitution saving throws, and you're incentivized to have a good constitution score. So you might be able to reliably nail your concentration checks, but if you've got a squishy in your party, like a wizard, or a warlock, or even the cleric, or even in some cases, you can have characters like paladins who are proficient in constitution saving throws, and so concentration checks can be an issue for them. You could help one of your allies out with this spell. So I think this is one of those ones where, again, you really want to look at what your allies have and what their needs are versus your own. I think this one is like a 4.5 for me. Yeah. I, I think that it, its stock rises if there's someone else in the party that could really benefit from it. Um, but I'm, I'm actually not too worried about making concentration checks myself as an artificer most of the time if i'm playing a spellcaster let's say that i'm playing a wizard chances are that i have already decided that i'm going to take warcaster as a feat mm -hmm. it's one of my go-to feats it's pretty essential for a lot of uh, casters who already have those concentration spells if for some reason you have a spellcaster who hasn't taken Warcaster yeah. or hasn't taken Resilient Constitution. This can help them get there and allow them to have that protection on their concentration. But I've actually found that failing a concentration check is something that is almost a once in a while, oh my god, it actually happened. I lost <laughs> concentration. Who knew? But it's not one of those things that's a constant threat to me. Is it valuable to have protection against it? Absolutely. That's why we have feats like Warcaster that we constantly recommend. I think that 4.5 sounds correct. Uh, I think in our initial look, we gave it a 5 out of 5. But I think the other 5 out of 5 options take precedent over this. Yeah, I, I think like thinking about it, because yes, losing concentration sucks. 
it's bad. Like it, 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 it really does impair whatever your game plan is in battle. And this can help you out in those rare situations. Like when you get hit with three attacks in a turn and you have to make three concentration checks and like, you know, you're probably going to get two of them, but then that it's that last one. That's usually when I see casters failing their concentration checks, when they get hit with multiple attacks. And this really helps cover you in that because you're still relying on your, str your strong innate defenses. Um, or it can help you out if you're really bad at making those checks. I think it's safe to say that this is still one of the best infusions offered and should be highly considered, um, but might not be your first choice. Yeah, it's just because there's so many other ways to bolster your concentration. Next up, we come to Radiant Weapon. This requires level six and does require attunement. This allows you to imbue a weapon with Radiant Energy, making it glow. And if you are hit with an attack, you can then blind the enemy who targeted you. This requires one of the four charges in the weapon and a reaction. And the attacker gets to make a saving throw against your spell saving throw DC. This is one of those options that I think is really cool to put on your party tank. Because if they have a glowing radiant weapon and they get hit with an attack, they can blind their attacker and then their attacker now has disadvantage on any subsequent attacks against them. So it is a kind of a cool combat trick, but it does feel relatively narrow in application. I think it seems super fitting to give to your party paladin, and I'm sure they would be overjoyed to have a cool radiant glowing sword, but using one of your infusions to give your paladin something that is moderately useful, uh, again, there's value here. Uh, it's just comparing it to the other infusions. I don't think it's your best choice. I, I think I'd be safe to give this a three out of five. I think that ultimately what this ability is doing is it's giving a limited circumstance where the target, where attack rolls against whoever is bearing this weapon have disadvantage. But the thing is, is that artificers have a spell like blur on their spell list. And ultimately bringing the blur spell and casting blur is a smaller cost for an artificer than using up one of your party's attunement slots that has to go on a weapon that has to count as one of your limited infusions. So if your goal is, I want to protect my party member by making sure attacks against them have disadvantage, well, Blur does a much better job than this. This also has the perk of making that a magical weapon, but it's kind of that, it's got to hit that kind of key point of like, my ally needs a magic weapon, but also a defensive perk. I think it's limited. I, I, I'm i tempted to give it like a two, but maybe it's a three. Yeah, I think that if you see the moment that this is useful, go for it. But that moment is going to be rare. With our next infusion, Repeating Shot, there's no level requirement, although it does require a weapon with the ammunition property and it does require attunement. This allows you to ignore the loading property of that weapon. Your weapon now also does a plus one bonus to attack and damage rolls and conjures its own ammunition. The benefits of this infusion work really well with a crossbow and allow you to basically use the benefits of extra attack to fire the crossbow twice. So your crossbow wielding sharpshooter might benefit from this unless they've also taken Crossbow Expert, in which case there's a bit of an overlap here and this kind of loses steam as an infusion. Yeah, you might be tempted though to use this yourself, particularly if you are say a battlesmith that is making ranged attacks and using a crossbow because many battlesmiths might want to use a crossbow as their primary attack, but they're going to be using their own bonus action to command their um, steel defender and so they're not really interested in taking crossbow expert but you might want to use that nice beefy d10 damage heavy crossbow and take sharpshooter so i think that the clearest application for this infusion is with a battlesmith artificer that is still commanding their steel defender wants to take the sharpshooter feat wants to be using that heavy crossbow that's where you're singing here yeah that that's where this becomes a five out of five but for most other cases it might be a three out of five yeah uh, and for some cases if you're like i'm gonna give this to my sharpshooter crossbow expert and they're like i have no use for this then it's a one out of five i i think in that light i want to give this overall a four out of five to basically say it's 
one of the options that you should look at, but it's very important for certain options and not so important for others. So then we come to the really big infusion here, which is replicate magic item. This infusion actually can be taken multiple times because it has a very specific wording. When you take this infusion, you choose a magic item from the lists and tables presented in the Artificer class description. And this allows you to turn a mundane, non-magical item into the corresponding magic item that's in this list. So as an example, you could take a regular sack and take replicate magic item, bag of holding, and turn your regular bag into a bag of holding. So the, the key thing with replicate magic item is that you have to choose the specific magic item that you want to replicate every time you take this infusion. It doesn't let you take this once and kind of like mix and match as you go. And with Replicate Magic Item, it is split into the ones that you can take right away at second level, the ones that you can get at level six, the ones you can get at level 10, and the ones that you can get at level 14, which get progressively stronger. Um, and then whether or not the item then requires attunement depends on what the magic item is in the Dungeon Master's Guide. There's a lot of primo choices here. <laughs> yeah, just very quickly, I think that we should go over some of our top choices, but I think we could do a whole episode about what yeah, choices yeah. to take. I think the go-to second level item is going to be either the Bag of Holding or the Sending Stones. And I think if you really need to, you also have the option to create Goggles of Night. Uh, if somebody doesn't have dark vision and they're that poor sap who's <laughs> bumbling around in the darkness while the rest of the party is like, come on, man, catch up. Um, I might be tempted at level 6 to make the Cloak or Boots of Elven Kind, or possibly even the Lantern of Revealing to reveal invisible enemies. At 10th level, there's actually a lot of standout options. I think things like the Hat of Disguise, or the Cloak of Protection, or the Ogre Gauntlets are all great, but I think the standout option here is the Winged Boots. Oh yeah, I'm taking this infusion for that alone, <laughs> for the winged boots. I yeah. think the, the winged boots are the, the winner overall here. If I was looking at all the infusions, I think adding the winged boots to my artificer, I imagine yeah. that is like the rocket boots. That... Might as well basically say your artificer gets to fly starting at level 10. Yeah. At 14th level, you are probably looking at something like the ring of protection or the amulet of health. Both are going to be very powerful for you as the frontliner or again if we're talking about that frontliner that you're trying to stack up those bonuses on either of those options might be really beneficial for them one of the things that's actually very interesting here are the, is the fact that things like the amulet of health and the belt of hill giant strength and the headband of intellect are on this list because your artificer could have a very low strength and constitution but if you're playing at higher levels you could just be like well i'm just going to magic myself up and boost my constitution to 19 or my strength to 21 because i'm getting these higher level magic items all in all this infusion i think we need to rank five out of five just based on the versatility there are so many ways that you can use this infusion to benefit the party and change the game for mm -hmm. your entire crew just going into any situation there's an option here that's going to work I would probably take this infusion more than once, unless I got Boots of Flying or an Amulet of Health in some other way. <laughs> Next up we come to the Repulsion Shield. This has a requirement of being level 6, it also requires attunement, it has to be on a shield, and now the shield has 4 charges and as a reaction when you are hit with an attack you can use a charge to repulsion the person who hit you 15 feet away from you pretty key for a lot of different uses for a lot of different people. Again, one of the cool things about the Repulsion Shield, as opposed to say the Enhanced Defense Infusion, is the Repulsion Shield at level 6, when you get it, you're getting the same AC bonus, but you're also granting this Repulsion ability, but the cost of that Repulsion ability is that the character that wears it has to attune to it. So that's kind of the weight with all of these things. Like the there's There's all these infusions like this one where you're getting the bonus but you're also having to attune to the item and you have to com weigh that against the benefit of just the raw enhanced defense and enhanced um, armor which don't ask you to attune the repulsion shield might be a great choice for that frontliner who may have wanted the radiant weapon but now if an uh, enemy uses their entire movement to get up to you and you use your reaction to repel them 15 feet away and they had multiple attacks and you did that after the first attack well 
you just kind of blew their chances to hit you yeah. multiple times. So I would say giving my Paladin the Repulsion Shield rather than the Radiant Weapon, I think that's that's going to be a better choice. And there's a few Artificers who might want people to get the heck away from them. So th it could be a cool option. I, I think I want to give this one a 3 out of 5. Again, there are many times that this could be a useful option to consider. But the other ones that we've given 5 out of 5 might be a little bit better and more widely applicable. Next up, we have the resistant armor. Again, this is a suit of armor. You have to be six level to create this infusion, and the armor then requires attunement. This armor grants you resistance against one of the elemental damage types. So you can't use this to get bludgeoning, piercing, or slashing damage resistance, but you can get things like fire, acid, cold, necrotic, poison, all that good stuff. I give this one a three out of five. If you need the resistance, you need the resistance. If you know you're fighting a red dragon, this is a five out of five, it's great, <laughs> right? But it, it's one of those ones where you really do need to know what you're going up against and know, is this gonna give its dividends and returns and be worth the attunement slot going into? I think that's the tough thing about picking and choosing what you're going to be resistant to is if you're doing that without any idea what you're going to face, this could be a total letdown. If you're like, I'm gonna make acid resistant armor and then you never deal with acid damage, which you mm -hmm. probably won't very much, then it was a useless infusion. But if you have a little bit of foresight and there's a reason that you're like, oh, we could really use resistance to a certain type of damage, then, then yeah, this is important. I mean, most of the time it's gonna be fire poison or necrotic, unless you're fighting mind flayers, in which case probably bringing the psychic damage. Yeah. But, but even then, it, it, it's, it's a tough call. You've got to know what's happening next. And I think with all of that in mind, that means that this actually is a harder infusion to use and to choose over the, over the more readily apparent options. Mm -hmm. Next, we have Returning Weapon, which should be used on a thrown weapon. It grants a plus one bonus to attack and damage rolls, and the weapon immediately returns to your hand. This is another one of those infusions that I think sounds cool on paper, but I actually don't see much use for this unless you're playing that really niche dagger thrower character. The niche here really is I have a secondary ranged attack with a thrown weapon, like a throwing axe or a javelin or a dagger, and I need a weapon that bypasses damage resistance because oftentimes you might have a magic javelin or a magic dagger, but you're only gonna have one of them, not a bunch. So if you're throwing multiple daggers or javelins at an enemy that is resistant to non-magical damage, then that's where the use case comes. But it, it's really, really, like, it's narrow. It's it's super narrow. So again, if you need it, you need it. But for me, this is like a two out of five. I agree. Lastly, we come to the spell Refueling Ring. This does require you to be 6th level and it does require attunement. And as an action, you can replenish a spell slot of 3rd level or lower. A lot of spellcasters like gaining an extra spell slot. This is kind of the pearl of power that you're creating yourself. Yeah, it, it basically is a pearl of power, which is an awesome magic item. Uh, I think I would use this for myself as an artificer. It's great. I've got a limited number of spell slots. and. Getting back a third level spell slot is always going to be relevant for artificers because you only get up to fifth level spells and you don't get higher than third level spells until level 13. So this is going to be pretty relevant at getting back one of your highest level spell slots for a very long period of your career. I also think that if you didn't want to use it on yourself, maybe you're not relying on your spell casting as much for some reason, but um, a warlock always likes being able yeah. to regain a spell yeah. slot even if it's a lower level than what they're capable of casting still being able to bring back a third level spell slot when they've blown through their two spell slots that they have it's always useful yeah. so if you have a warlock in your party they probably are going to be asking you like please make me this and you might want to i give this one a five out of five i think it's a must have like being able to get one of your highest level spell slots back you know, you're only going to have two or three third level spell slots. So this is like a 50% increase in the number of third level spell slots you have. I, I agree. I think that this is one of the better infusions to consider. Yeah. So let's think for a second about a 10th level artificer who is going to be able to have four infusions active at a mm. time. What would you pick? Well, if I'm playing an armor, I actually get to have six infusions active at any one time. Yeah. So for the in the armor case, I would probably go with the homunculus, the winged boots, mm -hmm. enhanced defense on my chest piece, 
enhanced gauntlets mm -hmm. on the gloves, go for the Helm of Awareness, and probably the Spell Refueling Ring. You know, once again, Monty and I made these lists and then conferred with each other, and it yeah. turns out that we picked the exact same thing. I think that you and I both were in agreement that, that that sort of package... Now, this is also playing a little bit of the greedy artificer. Yeah, that very much is. This is that now you've decked yourself out with all of your infusions. Now, if we're looking at something like the Battlesmith, which I think is another one of our favorite yeah. options here, you're going to only get four. Now, one of the interesting things is the homunculus that we kind of advertise as being great for everybody might not actually be my first choice here because I do have the Steel Defender. That's true. That's true, which you can't command them both at the same time with the bonus action, right? Yeah. yeah. Now, we did actually see that there's a lot of value if I'm playing a Battlesmith of taking the repeating shot. And that, along with the winged boots, allows me to now be a flying <laughs> double super crossbow uh, wielding artificer. Watch out, rangers. Yeah. <laughs> well, my steel defender is doing the rest yeah. of the work. I might also consider the mind sharpener and the helm of awareness as my other two choices to kind of complete this package. But that sounds like a great battlesmith to me. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. And I think that if you're doing an artillerist or an alchemist, you would probably then have the homunculus, but not have the repeating shot and still do the same combo. Yeah, that sounds reasonable. Yeah. All in all, I think that there's a lot of versatility within these infusions. And I think that there's actually a lot of ways that you can go. Some of the ones that we ranked three and four out of five might actually be the best choice in the right circumstance. But some of the ones that we ranked five out of five, I think need to be highly considered and are some of the standout options here. Keep in mind what tools you can use to amplify the holes that your party has or even up the power of what your party's already excelling at. I mean, looking at this though, I, it's really hard to not want to be selfish. <laughs> I agree. And I 100% am just throwing out there that I, I know that I'm a selfish artificer player. I'm going to stock up as many of these infusions as I can on myself. And if I run out of cool options for myself, then I might mm. make something for my friends. I think the, the biggest difficulty here is that actually with a lot of these options that we put together is that you've actually used up all your a lot of your own attunement slots. The aforementioned Battlesmith has used up three of their attunements in their yeah. own infusions. Now, luckily, Artificers have the benefit of having more attunement slots yeah. than others every other class in the game so you do have a little bit of wiggle room there but you do want to be aware of what you're equipping yourself with and what might be beneficial to give to your party so this has been a look at artificer infusions in dungeons and dragons fifth edition tell us about your favorite infusions in the comments below the videos that we create on our channel are made possible thanks to the incredible generosity of our patreon supporters if you enjoy the work that we do here on youtube please consider becoming a supporter of the channel by following the links in the description below also, we're making a book. Dungeons of Drakenheim is coming to Kickstarter. We've partnered with Ghostfire Games to bring this campaign to life as a fifth edition module. You can follow the links below or head to drakenheim.com to join our mailing list and keep up to date on all the news regarding the upcoming Kickstarter. Don't forget to check out our live play Shadows of Drakenheim, which airs Tuesday nights at 6 p.m. Eastern at Twitch. You can find all the previous episodes right up over here. And we have plenty more guides to the various classes and subclasses in Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition right up over here. Please subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an episode. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next time in, in the, the Dungeon. dungeon.